Just getting matters surrounding the NSSF saga. Chair, is the last person to introduce himself a witness or part of the select committee? This wing is for technical and select committee. I will address that. The committee is. Uh, the committee has specific terms of reference. One, to examine the corporate governance structures at the NSSF. Two, to examine the circumstances surrounding the appointment of the funds MD. Three, to evaluate the status and safety of the savers' money in the fund. <coughs> Four, to examine the extent of stakeholder engagement in the decision making at the fund. And lastly, to inquire into any other matters incidental there too. This is the second time, and I believe this is the last time you are going to appear before this committee. And it is probably why we invited specific departments to come in large numbers. Members may want to interact with the members of your departments and not specifically the heads of those departments. Uh, we have also invited various stakeholders. We have the unions, NOTU. We have the former managing director because some of the decisions were taken when he was still the managing director and probably Mr. Yota may not have responses. Since this is the last time, we thought we could invite you during our previous engagement with the former MD I believe most of you are watching on screen and probably giving him answers to some of the questions. So since you are in the same room, I don't know how that is going to work. Uh, but um, it has really been a tiring investigation. You loaded us with several information, very large documents. But luckily enough, we have managed to dissect those documents in the quickest time possible, and it will be evident in the questions we are going to ask. Um, for those who have never been to this committee or a, a parliamentary committee, allow me to give you just insight into how committees operate and the special powers these committees have. Uh, 208 of our rules of procedure, special powers of committees. In exercise, in exercise of their functions, a committee may call any minister or any person holding public office and private individuals submit memoranda to appear before them and give evidence. That means we can select anyone who has introduced himself to give us information, and not specifically the heads or your corporation secretary or your acting MD or even your former MD. B, may employ qualified persons to assist in the discharge of their functions. C, may call or invite any person to take part in the proceedings of the committee without the right to vote. D, shall have the powers of the High Court for I, enforcing the attendance of witnesses and examining them on oath or affirmation or otherwise, as you will see, should the witness try to give contradictory information, a member can ask, to put you on oath under Rule 212 of our Rules of Procedure. At that time, should you be put on oath and you continue giving us falsehoods, when we are aware of the facts, you'll have committed perjury and you will be escorted immediately to wherever they will take you. I, two, sorry, compelling the production of documents. Should this committee require any document, you must provide it. Three, issuing a commission or request to examine witnesses abroad. E, order for their arrest and confinement. You will carry the cross and not your boss should you be the one to be asked a question. So we expect nothing and nothing but the truth. We have invited you in large numbers. Probably we have closed the NSSF today. It should not be in vain. So without wasting much of your time, allow me to invite the management of NSSF, they have a presentation, uh, a response to some of the questions we asked last time, and thereafter we can go into the serious business. So, can we have the acting MD? Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, yeah, just a minute. Um, Honorable Bakawulindi raised the matter of proceed. It doesn't mean that he has gone into management. Mm. 
and maybe uh, the committee would like to be looking at him. You never know who could be picking non-verbal cues from the questions and his reactions. So my, my opinion is that let him be the other side too, if it is okay with you. And I Bogafa. Chair, the only colleague has uh, said exactly what I wanted to say, because there are questions. To put the other side, probably. And he can sit there. You want to give him space. He should not be too close to the current MD. You never know wh what could happen. So uh, you can uh, just move the. You can go and sit at the end. Remove that. Let's have that chair removed. You can see the body language already from the staff. They are happy. Uh, can we go back into serious business? Deputy, uh, sorry, current uh, managing di acting managing director, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, raised uh, by the committee the last time we're here, uh, we provided written responses, and I'll just go through them uh, as fast as we can, and then you can... Uh, seek for clarification. We've kind of bashed them based on the thematic area so that the flow uh, makes it more easily to explain. Current state of the suspense account, we we'll begin by taking the suspense account basically arises out of the following situations. Uh, recovery of audited arrears from members that are no longer employed with the audited company at the time of remittance and cannot be immediately be traced for registration purposes. The collection of contribution for new employees without national identification numbers, which are prerequisite for registration with the NSSF. We now have 52 billion shillings in what we call the suspense account as of the 6th of February 2023, broken down basically in two parts. We have 16 billion in current member suspense, and we have what we call 36 billion shillings in historical suspense. Uh, we have cleared records worth 9 billion from the suspense account for the period July 2022 to uh, Feb 2023. We have in place initiatives to mitigate the growth of suspense, including the e-collection portal, which makes it impossible for employers to remit without complete employee information. Publication of suspense in different media platforms, as well as field engagements aimed at tracing members on the suspense account. We have also fully integrated with NIRA to enable registration of members, and this has significantly reduced the amount of incoming suspense. The bulk of the suspense relates to historical periods. Once all efforts to clear suspense are exhausted, we will publish all pending suspense and have it moved to the reserves as per provision of the NSF Act. There is a process for clearing of funds from the suspense account. Upon registration of, of members whose funds are on suspense account, the contributions are transferred to the members' account. The robust control to ensure that the rule of maker checker is followed in the process of suspense management. How are the decisions for penalty waivers made? The NSF Act gives the managing directors powers to waive penalty, and this has been exercised on several employers. Following an audit of an employer, the fund makes a demand for arrears, interest therein, and penalty. Upon settlement of the arrears and interest, employers are free to apply for waiver of penalty. And if they meet the eligibility criteria, that payment of interest and principal in full, they are either granted full or partial waiver of the penalty. Do balances in suspense account receive interest? Yes. The money in suspense account is part of the total balance upon which the fund declares interest. And once a member on suspense is stressed and registered, all contributions and accrued interest are credited to the member's account. Uh, the soccer fraud case, what steps have been taken to recover this money? The staff concern was subject to a, a, dis a disciplinary process leading to their exiting the fund. The fund filed a complaint with the police to recover the affected funds. Uh, Mr. Soccer has since been tried in the Art Corruption Court and a ruling is awaited. We have also measures put in place to improve the controls. In fact, there's an internal audit report that we, we have submitted to the committee regarding uh, this case. Uh, breakout of members with differences in balances, about 2.2% of total membership, that's 34,000 members, have balances of 100 million shillings and over. Now, this 
percentage of members hold 7.9 trillion shillings in the balances, which constitutes about 47.3% of the member of the total member fund. About 2.4% of total membership, that's 36,000 members, have balances of between 50 to 99 million shillings, and their combined balance is 2.5 trillion shillings, representing 15.2% of total member funds. About 95% of the members, that's 1.4 million members, have balances of less than 50 million shillings, and the combined balance is 6.2 trillion shillings, representing 37.4% of total member fund. What's interesting to note is, out of the 1.4 million members who have balances of less than 50 million shillings, 1.2, almost 1.3 million members, which is 83.4%, have balances of less than 10 million shillings, and they have combined balance of 2.3 trillion shillings, which is 13.7% of the total member funds. Total number of investments made and how many lost to values in respect to real estate. We have 210 total investments that have been made, broken down as follows. 142 government bonds, Four fixed deposits at this point in time, one corporate bond, one loan, 27 listed equities, four private equity investments, one private equity fund, and 30 pieces of land slash projects slash properties. Only one real estate actually lost to value. This is the West Nile Golf Club that was acquired before 2010. And at this point in time, we are, we are putting in effort to recover uh, those monies. It's important for the committee to note that we, the fund takes a portfolio, a portfolio view of its investments. The portfolio view enables the fund to monitor the performance of the investment on an overall basis. The fact that the fund has grown consistently over the years proves that there have been higher performing assets than lower performing assets within the investment portfolio. Are you aware of any undervalued assets? No, we are not currently. When planning housing investment, who is our target? The target market is informed by the neighborhood and product positioning. Loboa phase one, 306 units is a high-end product. We believe there's a market for this product. Disputed as follows. Members with high balances of salaries, senior managers in the corporate world or capitals of industry from the funds database, this group has almost 1,500 members. Uganda and the diaspora, many have, been many, many have been fleeced by their relatives in attempting to build house organically. There are over 1 million Ugandans in the diaspora but we are targeting at least 100 of that group. Expatriates, high net worth Ugandans in the informal sector. Moreover, the project will be phased. We cannot embark on phase two if phase one has not been sold. Temangalo is an affordable housing product positioning. Phase one is 550 units. We also have Chanja, which is 160 units. Uh, the feasibility studies for, for, for Luboa, Temangalo, and Pension Towers have been provided uh, to the committee. In terms of process of cost variations, which are normally caused by changes in scope and time previously envisaged in the contract, these are done in accordance with the PPDA Act and regulations, and we've actually availed the detailed um, specifics on the projects that we submitted earlier on. Current status of investment, uh, investment portfolio, assets under management grew by 9% in the fourth quarter of 2022, the 31st December 2022, to 17.3 trillion compared to 15.9 trillion in the fourth quarter, quarter of 2021. On a quarter on a quarter basis, assets under managed growth by 0.9%. The total portfolio returned 2.5% over the quarter, which is 89 basis points lower than the previous quarter, while year on year return was 12.6%, and the target for the financial year is 12%, two percentage points lower than the previous year. Detailed reports have also been submitted to the committee. How are investments initiated? The investment must be in accordance with the investment policy and the UBRA investment guideline. The approval process depends on the asset class. Essentially, the initial screening is by the investment team. If found attractive, the prospect taken to management investment, the prospect is taken to the management investment committee. If approved, is then taken to the investment and project, uh, to the project uh, monitoring committee of the board, and thereafter, if the board if it's approved by IP, IPMC, the board we get board approval. If it's a real estate project or unlisted equity investment, we seek a no objection from the minister in charge of investments. More on the process depicted in the investment policy statement and the procedures which have been provided to the committee. 
uh, what's the process for real estate procurement? There must be a budget. If and when approved, the budget informs the procurement plan. Initiation is by the user department. By raising a PPDF Form 5 to MD through the CFO, the Form 5 will include the terms of reference. After all approvals, the Form 5 is sent to head of procurement department unit, who takes it to the contracts committee together with the bidding document. After approval, the advertisements are made, bidding documents are issued to bidders, the head PD will then seek contracts committee approval for the evaluation committee. After evaluation, two processes take place, notice of best evaluated bidder and award. After the award, the information is sent to LEGO to draft the contract, which is sent to Solicitor General for clearance. After the Solicitor General clearance, the draft contract is issued to the bidder. Explain the Bebeja government project. The Bebeja project is a build, own, and transfer kind of contract where government identified a piece of land in Webaja, which the fund acquired with the objective of building a government campus that will accommodate all ministries and MDAs, about 200,000 square meters gross, 150,000 square meters letable. The land acquisition was complete, a project consultant has been procured, and the designs are underway. The fund will build the campus, and upon completion, will hand it over to government, which will pay rent for 15 years, after which the property will be owned permanently by government. The fund will earn an internal rate of return of 21.9% for the benefit of members. Status of the contract for the development of useful Lulea project. The initial project was canceled because, among others, the bid price was higher than available budget. The fund is in the process of procuring another vendor. Status of the procurement of the Nakival, Nakigalala land slash meeting with Madivani. Acquisition starts with the strategic objective that's being pursued. The budgeting process takes into account prospects that are likely to be done in the financial year. The plan, is, the plan to acquire is included in the budget. The board recommends and the minister approves the budget. The first leg in the investment process requires MIC approval, IPMC approval, board approval, and seeking the no objection of the minister in charge of investments. After the investment has been fully approved, then the second leg starts, which is the procurement leg. The board has not yet approved the procurement of the Nakigalala land, pending the completion of the due diligence process per the board's earlier directive. The due diligence process has not yet been concluded, mainly due to multiple claims on the land which have not yet been resolved by the potential vendor. Engineering integrity reports for Pension Tower. The project consultant and an independent firm, Robert Warren, have indicated that there is no structural crack at Pension Towers. Copies of the two reports, one from the structural engineer and the other from Robert Warren, were submitted to the committee by management. A procedure for budgeting, that is the submit as one of the attachments, that was submitted to the, to the committee. So I will not go through that one, that's an actual attachment for the committee. Growth and performance of the fund balance sheet and P&L, that is also an attachment which shows over the last five years the performance of the bond. If I just read asset size, in 2017-18, the fund was 9.9 .9 trillion shillings. 2018-2019, it was 11.3 trillion. 2019-20, the fund was 13 trillion. 2021, the fund was 15.5 trillion shillings. And 21-22, the fund was 17.3 trillion shillings. And the steady growth has actually seen in terms of how it has grown in there. From a realizing camp perspective, which is your PNL, the fund realized 1.3 trillion shillings in 2017-2018. 1.2 trillion in 2018-2019, 1.4 trillion in 2019-2020, 1.8 trillion in 2021, and then 1.7 trillion in 2021-22. In terms of uh, interest, that was the expense ratio, which measures the, the efficiency that the fund has. The basic the efficiency ratio in 2017 was 1.16%, 2018-2019 was 1.27%, 2019-2020 was 1.91%, 2021 was 1.06%, 2021-22 is 1.18%. And here, just in terms of just to do a comparison, for funds of our size uh, globally, there are about 320 firms, uh, pension funds that are of our size. The global benchmark is 2.2%, and we are running at about around 1.18% compared to our neighbors. Uh, who are far, far away behind us. Interest rate to the members in 2017, 2018 was 15%, 2018, 2019, 11%, 2019, 2020 was 10.75%, 2022, 12.115%. 
2021-22 was 9.65 percent. Do you have performance targets? Yes, sir, we have. They are based on we the fund uh, constructs in strategy in 10-year cycles. Uh, the first initial 10-year cycle is ending in 2025, so we have got targets for 2025. We have actually four strategic outcomes we seek by 2025. One, that the fund would be a 20 trillion shilling fund. Right now, the chairman, we are around 17, about 18 trillion shillings, and we're about two years out of 2025. Uh, the second one is, to get 20 trillion shillings, we must make sure that our members are actually pleased, are happy, engaged, satisfied with the services we offer. And the target for that is 95%. Right now, sir, we are running around 83%. But the target for this year alone was 87%. So we're about 5% behind. We have about five months to basically catch up on that. To serve and make our customers happy, you must make sure that the staff who serve them are actually engaged, satisfied. And so we have with the staff satisfied target of 95%. And uh, right now, we are around, the target for this year was 92%. We are hovering right around 92%. And then lastly, the staff must have processes that are really good that actually will deliver the things that they need. And the target for 2025 was one day, processing time for age benefit. Right now, we are doing about eight days, 8.4 8 .4 days, and the target for this year is eight days. So when we look at the 2025 targets, we are most likely going to get there. In fact, here, what we've done is we are now beginning to talk about the 2035 vision, which is the next 10-year cycle. So basically, our 2025 uh, strategic outcomes are going to be milestones as we go through the next strategic time. Done better? The answer is yes. I think the fund is not a typical investment firm. We are basically managed in a very tight regulatory em environment. Uh, a private fund, a private real estate developer doesn't have to go through the things that we go through. So the one question would be, could we have done better if we didn't have all the uh, regulatory compliance matters we need to? Yes, we would have done better in that case. What legal framework or policy governs any donation that the fund makes? The fund donations are gov governed by the corporate social responsibility policy. The fund's corporate social responsibility embeds the concept of sustainability beyond profit maximization and there are and it's threefold, namely building partnerships, good corporate governance, and corporate philanthropy. Within the context of corporate philanthropy, the fund is enabled to donate and has on several occasions donated to several public and private organizations, including the unions. What has been the relationship between COF2 and NOTU? The fund's relationship with unions is premised on the ILO Convention Number 144 on tripartism, which is basically government workers and employers, which is now operationalized through the NSF Act as amended. Traditionally, the fund has engaged the unions on a CSRI basis, especially on sensitization of members. Active reports from the unions. When an entity requests for a donation, that entity indicates the purpose of the donation. If the fund determines that the donation meets the CSR policy, disbursement then is made. The entities are not required to provide activity reports. Because the donation to unions were under CSR, just as with the other entities, there were no requirement for them to provide activity reports. Genesis of the MOU with COF2. With the enactment of the NSF Amendment Bill, the fund is seeking ways of extending coverage without necessarily expanding its network. The fund has patterned with banks and bank agents to enable collection of contributions. Unions have several members, and therefore this catchment area for the fund to tap into as not all union members are registered with the fund. This is the genesis for the MOU with the COF2. In fact, we began discussions between both KNOTU and COF2, I believe, in August. Uh, we, we held a meeting with them because at that point we realized if we're going to want them to be, be able to deliver, we need to kind of have a different type of relationship which would have accountability and basically deliverables and results that we would count on. However, to actualize the MOU, the parties have to agree on targets and ways to measure the partnership. On 12-14, Dr. Limok wrote to the fund how much was given to COFTA as a result. The fund received the letter from COFTU, and as is the practice, a request for funding made to the fund does not mean that the funds are released. The fund did not act on the letter, and no monies were dispersed to COFTU. How does NSF handle other stakeholders? Our stakeholder management policy defines how we handle stakeholders. 
Section 5 of the Fund Stakeholder Managing Policy spells this out. We seek partnership with stakeholders who command influence and are highly interested in the fund. We engage stakeholders who command power but are not highly interested in the fund. We keep informed stakeholders who are highly interested in the fund but do not have any influence at all. Was the six billion approved? The matter of the six billion was presented to the board. The board directed management to prepare detailed activities and work plan and budget to support the intended objective. On November 25th, 2022, there was a consultative meeting with the board, senior management, and attended by the Honorable Minister of Gender, Labor, and Social Development, in which a draft work plan was presented. A directive was given to management to refine the plan to be presented to the board for its consideration and endorsement. This is still pending. How did DMD become acting MD? DMD was appointed by the board on 1st December 2022 to caretake the office of the managing director pending substantive appointment of an MD as per section 39 of NSF Act as amended. This was after the board received and considered the minister's letter asking the board to oversee an interim arrangement for the current DMA to act as the managing director until the office substantially filed. We have actually provided these letters also to the committee. Role of MD and DMD, the job description for the two roles have been provided to the committee. What does the Human Resource Policy Manual say about the age of staff? NSF Human Resource Policy Procedures Manual states the retirement age of the fund shall be 60 years. An employee shall proceed on normal retirement after a tenure of 60 years. The policy also provides for a discretionary two-year extension where the employee has special skills or competences or experience. What was the age of the MD and DMD at the time they were recommended for appointment? The age of the MD and DMD when recommended for appointment were 61 years and 62 years respectively. The board's recommendation for a five-year term for the MD and DMD was based on advice from the Solicitor General and that one, you know, the statutory officers were not bound by the retirement age stated in the Human Resource Policy Manual. Learning center status, we've got uh, an update that we've attached uh, for members to basically go through. Policy, we will discuss that. Contracts for all top management, chairman, these were all provided to the committee. HR policy has been provided to the committee. The organogram before and after the, uh, the reorganization has also been provided. Minutes and resolution of top management has, has also been provided. And the audited financial statement for the last five years uh, have also been provided. So I submit. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, honorable members. Um, it's 12.42. Would you wish to ask the questions now? Would you wish to break off for an early lunch so that we do a marathon? Because if we asked all the questions, they would still not be able to respond right now, before lunch. How would you want us to proceed? Honorable Bakaulindi? Uh, thanks, Chair. There are two sets of questions. The first set is a lot of the response. The second set is what we have out of the various documents. We don't want to mix the two. We, the, the first set of questions is in the form of clarification. At exactly 1.15, we shall resume. I'm, su I'm there for suspending this committee sitting for exactly 30 minutes. We welcome you to the canteen, the parliamentary canteen, although you are too many. <laughs> but we invite you to our parliamentary canteen to have an early lunch so that we can proceed without interruptions. Meeting, uh, meeting suspended.
How is the fun? You're still holding out, still making money for the members. Hey, what do you mean? Tell the committee I want to be back. companies that had um, not paid their NSF dues. Is this correct? Yes, Chair. Can you supply us with a, a copy of a list of these companies? What was the total amount? Chair, I, I would need to provide the specific report to this committee. And uh, since this question has not been asked, I can provide the relevant report. Did those companies pay that money? Some paid, some didn't pay. So those who didn't pay, was this money waived off? Not necessarily being waived off. Waving, uh, waving off is, is a process, uh, like uh, it has been explained. There is, uh, the, the managing director has powers to waive. Wave off what specifically? Can the MD wave off a contribution that was meant to go to one individual? Or the MD only waves off the interest? Uh, Chair, the MD can only wave off the penalty. The penalty. Yes. So did those companies pay that money? Uh, Chair, I would need to have a specific report because I think we are being general. But in terms of waiving, it is particularly the, the component of penalties. I am Interest aware of cannot that. be waived. I am aware of that, but I'm referring to your audit report. Can you get it before the end of this meeting? Because we are going back to that question. Chair, I can, I can get the audit report. Mm -hmm. Chair, mm. can the head of audit quote for us the law that gives the powers, the MD, to write off the penalties. I want you to quote the act and you read it to us. Uh, Chair, uh, I, I beg in this respect to ask the Cooperation Secretary to read the specific provision and it's part of the submission that we have already given. And a supplementary question towards this. Prepare those two issues. The next question goes to the corporation secretary. The amendment, this was um, the amendment section three. Is it at three, three, five, B and C? Provided for members of the board to, con to uh, consideration of persons with disabilities, balance of gender, skills, experience, amongst others. However, this amendment found already an existing board. Now it has come to our attention that you sat as a board where you also participate and you gave these people what I may call, what is it called, what is a better term for it, an exit package. We are informed that each member carried 700 and something million of the board. Now, we want to understand, under what legal framework, did you give these two board members, I think it was Koftu, I'm reading your minutes here, and on top of that, these members resigned. Communication from the chairman, you asked two members to resign, who were already on the existing board, in order to cater for the issues in the new act, that is people with disabilities, gender, and the rest. 
you went ahead to calculate the amount of money they were supposed to receive throughout that term and you compensated them and you asked them to resign in order to receive that compensation. These members came from NOTU and Employers Federation. Now, my understanding is when the, 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 the new law came into force, the board was already in existence. Now, why would you need to force someone to resign at the expense of the server to compensate 700 and something million per member? Yet you could have left them to run their term and then considered the issues of gender. So under what legal framework did you take this decision and how did you arrive at, at that money? Uh, Chair, uh, the information I have is that uh, these two members were not compensated only for the term they were in the office. They were actually compensated even for the second term they were intending to come back. So as they answer this, to really uh, clarify how that came about. But the other supplementary is, there were board members uh, from NOTU, from COFTU, from the Federation of Employers. How did they arrive specifically at those two? to make them, to ask them to resign. The one of NOTU, the one of Federation of Employers, why not COFTU? Let them tell us, could they tell us how they arrived at those specific two that were asked to resign? And uh, like you said, the Chair, our, our laws do not work retrospectively. By the time this law uh, was amended and became effective, the board was already there. Why did they have to implement the law retrospectively against the law? Thank you. Honorable Baka, another subject law. Can they quote us the law where a member resigns and you have to compensate? Thank you, Chair and Honourable Members. I'll start with uh, reading the provision that allows the MD the right to waive penalty. It's Section 14, um, Section 14 of the Act, Clause 2. Section 14 is penalty for delay of payment of contribution. Two reads the managing director may remit the whole or part of any penalty under this section, subject to such conditions as he or she may determine. Honorable Chair and Members, that is the enabling provision under which the MD exercises that discretion. And it's for penalty, not the principal contribution and interest. Those cannot be waived. Chair, the second question, I'll respond based on, like you said, my involvement in the proceedings. Although it's really um, the mandate to determine board membership and otherwise lies with the minister under the act. Chair and members, you're absolutely right that at the time this decision was made, there was a board that was properly constituted pursuant to the provisions of the NSSF Act prior to amendment. There was a board properly constituted. Then when the amendment happened, 2nd January 2022, we got a new supervising minister. The first session, to the best of my knowledge, that the Honorable Minister had with the board was to flag an issue that from what I have read and heard was raised actually from Parliament. An issue to do with the constitution of the board with respect to the gender imbalance. 
and the brief that she gave to the board, and I hasten to add, Chair, that she's best placed to, 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 to verify this. So I'm, I'm, I'm stating what I saw and heard. Yeah? We, we chose to ask the Corporation Secretary because we want the law. Okay. And not political uh, answers. We want exactly. The, I would have asked the MD here, mm. the former MD. We so, chose to ask you specifically. So, Chair, the law, my position, which I've already stated, was there was a properly constituted board. However, there was a concern raised by the new supervising minister about the composition of the board, specifically with respect to the gender imbalance. At the time, there were 10 board members including only one lady. So there were nine gentlemen and one lady. And so it was an issue. Chair, which Chair you have been so precise. I know when you talk of a member in, poly, uh, in parliament, the member did not stand to repeal the law. The member gave a proposition or a position by saying, in case in the future you will want to constitute a board, please be mindful about gender balance. You as a lawyer, does that it? contribution of a member in parliament so automatically repeals the law? No, definitely not. So definitely you you not. don't need to use cosmetic language. Tell us exactly mm. what we want to hear. Is this, was this lawful, yes or not? No, in my opinion, no. It, it's, yeah. Okay, finance director. How much did you pay these two board members? Mr. Chairman, uh, please allow me a few minutes to find out for my team. I don't have the specific numbers of head. Who is here who can respond in the finance department? Can we see your department by show of hands? We can select someone else. Because you are the heads of these departments, we don't have this. This is something that happened just recently. Can we have someone from finance by show of hands? Should you get, get, get us the attendance book we shall select? <laughs> you are hiding? You either know or you don't know. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I, I really, really give us some time to, do, to find out the numbers because we make so many payments and you can't remember all payments of aid. I would hesitate to give the committee a wrong figure. If you give us time, we should be able to give you a correct figure. Maybe we ask the questions and uh, we, we pick the leading questions when they start responding, mm. honorable members, because they all need time. Chair, they will intentionally dodge the questions in the pretext of trying to look for information. Let them answer the questions as they come, and we conclude whatever comes. Okay. So finance, we want to know how much you paid two board members. I ha we have your bank statement anyway. Kindly get me the password. Which account is, is specifically is used to pay these people? We can help you. <laughs> Citibank. Citibank, Mr. Chair. Okay, as you look, I will also look. Um, should we proceed to another question? For now. Okay. Um, okay, now, this is to finance and risk actually risk yes sorry before you proceed to the other question there's another part of the question they have they have not answered regardless of how much they paid these two board members under what legal framework did you pay after people have resigned from the board our understanding is that these board members are paid for the period they are serving on the board. But if they have resigned and then you compute what they should have earned for the entire period of the term of the board, 
under what legal framework did you do this, regardless of how much? And is it true, you, he asked, did you pay them for even a second term they had not started serving? Um, Chair, I could, I could bring a response. It's, they were not paid for the second term, for sure. That I can confirm. Then with respect to under what legal framework, um, the, the basis upon which they were paid was premised on best practice. Best practice because, like we, you've already observed, these were members serving on, on, on a board which was properly constituted. So for them to consider, for the board members to consider um, relinquishing a responsibility that was deemed to them to have been properly obtained, the board took into consideration the need to benchmark. It was best practice, really, honorable chair and members but uh, the board could probably pronounce itself further on this when they appear tomorrow. So you are saying if all the board members now resigned, you will pay up to the end of the term, then you again pay the ones that you will come? Actually, if you resigned today, would the fund pay you for the period you have not yet served? Yes, Chair, actually, they would. So. It, the situation would be determined based on the prevailing circumstances, so it depends on the reason as to why the resignation has happened. If it appears to be, um, you ask me, for example, if I am not, for example, willing to leave and I am compelled to leave, I would expect a compensation. But if I'm leaving of my own chair, volition... Chair, chair, I think the yeah. question was very simple. Mm -hmm. Corporation Secretary were a permanent worker. A body is not a permanent work. You are on contract, assuming, and somebody compels you to resign. You are using the word compel. We are assuming nobody is compelling a body member who is not permanent. What does the law say? That if I wake up and I say I've got a business somewhere, but I shouldn't leave this money, and I say I've resigned, do you pay me? The answer is simple. Yes or no? Chair, it's no. So, Chair, it's no. The circumstances determine. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, now, how you came, I'm reading your minutes. These are minutes of uh, um, held on, f on uh, 21st January 2022. You computed their money, their exit package, based on the following. The board emolments and the average investee company's tabulation. Should I assume even when someone is leaving, you look at the assets? What do you mean by investee company's tabulation? Chair, if you can give me a minute to look at the page you're looking at. Look for your minutes. I have them here, Chair. I'm just looking through. The, the heading is consideration of proposed exit package. Okay, Chair. Um, oh, Chair, that, so there was a proposal. Who brought the proposal? The board members brought a proposal to benefit from the same. So the proposal under consideration for the exit pa package under 6-1, the managing director presented the proposed exit package, um, which included the board emoluments, so that is a retainer and that would have been earned for the period they would have been on the board. The average investee company's tabulation speaks to, so some of our board members sit on boards of companies that the fund has invested in. So as board members in those companies, some of them pay similar emoluments, allowances, retainers. So the proposal was to take into account what such a board member sitting on another company would have earned. That's what this means, Chair. <laughs> uh, you want to supplement? You have found the money? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, each one was paid 312 million shillings. 312, mm. total is 700. Uh, that is around 624 million shillings. 624 and million. I will be happy to provide that detail after the meeting, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Yes. Okay. So, 
when you go to page 51, anyway, I'm sure you have the management reports. Now, let's go to head risk first. NSSF increased investment in Trade Development Bank, and uh, this was in 2022. Is this true? Yes. I am aware that this Trade Development Bank was not listed on the stock exchange. Under normal circumstances, you would wait for something to be put on the stock exchange unless you are the one soliciting. How did you know if it was not on the, on the stock exchange? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before we make an investment in any company, um, our investment team uh, carries out a research on different companies and determine which one can give us a better value and then make a, a proposal to a management committee on whether we should invest in that company or not. And then based on that proposal, um, we do a risk assessment and together with the investment proposal, that risk assessment is discussed at management investment committee. And once that committee is convinced that uh, it is okay to invest in this company, we go ahead and invest. For that particular investment, uh, it is not true, it is not listed on the stock exchange, but our investment policy has uh, a provision for private equity, uh, depending on whether that company is likely to give us a value, uh, we can make a decision to invest in that company. Now, the question was seen. Corporate investment practices require for a company floating equity shares to be listed on the stock exchange. Correct. Now, this bank, I don't even know where this bank is. This bank had not listed its shares on the stock exchange at that time. Correct. So how did you know it was actually selling shares? Uh, can I ask my colleague, no, head no, no, of no. investment? I want to hear from risk because okay. this is a risk to the saver's money. Okay, like I said, the process begins by scanning the market. We know the process. Yes. I'm asking how did you know this company was actually selling shares if you didn't put them on the stock exchange? Uh, we do engage different uh, entities. Um, even those that are, are not on the stock exchange, we engage different um, entities, and if they express interest in selling shares, we so participate you, in So in you solicit, shares. if I use another language? Really, I'm not <laughs> comfortable with the soliciting, but Doesn't the procedure require okay. a company to be listed on the stock exchange, yes or not? I, I did mention that our, when we're making investment, we follow our investment policy. And there is a provision that allows private equity where a company is not, invested, is not listed on the stock exchange. There's a reason I asked risk and not investment. And you are not yet understanding why I'm asking you. Supplementary. The chair or the committee is not saying it is not proper to deal with a, a company that is not listed on the stock exchange. Now, that is why we are asking the one in charge of risk, not the one of investment. The one of investment would find the sense in that because for him is about investment but for you who is in charge of risk management <coughs> that's why they are asking you as the one in charge of risk do you see that you are risking savers money in this way leave alone the decision to invest because areas of investment are many in this country Honorable Baka, supplemental. You see, Chair, when he was answering, I really got excited. He quotes the law and he quotes what they have as policy within the house. Which one is superior? 
what you have within your house, you are the ones who set it to favor what you want to do. What the law is saying, I think it should be the one leading. Why is it that when the chair is asking, say, but for us, in our house, we have this policy. Which one, is, uh, which one are you supposed to follow? Yes, Mr. Risk. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I'll begin with the last one. Of course, the law takes precedent, but I didn't mention um, the internal policy because it also guides us, but it's true, the law takes precedent. Uh, but the, the question the other honorable member asked me, how would I know that a particular entity or a company, which is not listed on the stock exchange, uh, is actually selling shares. Do I solicit? Well, when you are doing investment or when you're doing business, you interact with different people. And during that conversation, you could come across an information that there is an investment opportunity somewhere. Through brokers. You see, <laughs> because... Uh, we asked earlier about the 40 billion for the grain cans, and uh, the former MD clearly stated that there's no one would invest in the grain cans because it was not even listed on the stock exchange. Now, I'm wondering if I have a company, how would you know I am selling shares if I don't list it on the stock exchange? It means you are soliciting, you are now looking for them yourselves. But as a risk ahead of risk, is this right to invest in a company that, ha how would you know even anyway that they are, they are selling shares? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, the question has two parts. And I'll begin with the last one. How would you know that they are actually selling shares? And I, I was submitting and saying that um, as an investment person, you are a business person. You engage different, you have a conversation with different people. You can come across information that this particular person would be interested in making, uh, in, in, in it, uh, generating interest in, in, in investing in their business. So during that conversation, because we do move around and, uh, and meet different, uh, d different people. So in that conversation, you get to know that this particular entity or this person would be interested to do business with us. So you evaluate that opportunity. If it makes sense for you, you go ahead and, and do that. So the, the other leg of the, um, the question was asking me whether is, is that right? Uh, uh, there is no provision in the law. Like he okay. said. Okay, did you approve? Let's not waste your time. Yes, we did approve. You yourself had risk. Yes, I did, I did approve. Okay, that. Together yeah. with uh, my colleague at the Investment Management Committee. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Allow me to give you the detail of that particular investment. Uh, first of all, starting from the law, our investment policy has been cleared by OBRA. The UBRA guideline, the, the, the UBRA law allows UBRA to gazette investment guidelines for retirement schemes. That was done in 2014. According to those investment guidelines, they allow up to 15% in private equity. Now, the same investment, the, the, so, so the same investment guidelines, or the, the UBRA investment, the, the UBRA law requires retirement schemes to prepare investment policy statements which have a strategic asset allocation. Now, we have done our strategic asset allocation as the fund, where we have the optimum of fixed income at uh, 75%, the optimum of equities at... Uh, at uh, no, how did you know? Sorry. We, we don't have time for... We know you are okay. professionals at your okay. jobs and okay. the rest. Okay. How did you know this company was selling shares? Okay, so TDB Bank, or formerly PTA Bank, is a bank that is owned by commercial member states. Uganda, the government of Uganda as a sovereign is, is uh, a member of COMESA and a shareholder in the bank. Uga the government of Uganda shareholding is class A shareholder. It's, it's a class A shareholder. So in, uh, in uh, 2016 or 2015 or thereabout, I can get the details, 
the member states were required to increase their capital in the bank, and the government of Uganda at the time did not have the financing to take up their shares. What the TDB or PTA Bank did at the time, they changed the they, they amended their charter to allow pension funds of member states to participate on behalf of the sovereign. But to your question of uh, whether it is a risky investment as being unlisted, what was done was that uh, at the time, if uh, a pension fund was, active, was investing on behalf of the sovereign, the book value per share, so it's essentially what the, the, the investment that was being made was done at a book, what uh, was being done at a book value per share, as in a price to book of one. Essentially, you take the book value per shares according to the audited financial statements. And if my memory, sorry. The, the, the investment manager is just, was about to answer the question you asked, but he again dodged. How, because they are not listed on the stock exchange, okay. how did you know they were selling shares? Okay. We, the bank has been on a capital raising program when they amended the charter of the bank to allow for pension funds to invest on the behalf on behalf of the sovereign they indeed approached us they wrote they wrote to us we evaluated the investment presented it to management investment committee this being an unlisted investment required a no objection from the minister of finance so it is something that went all the way to the minister of finance and it was also cleared by the solicitor general Yes, they did. So they approached you? Yes, they did. Okay. Regarding Uganda Clays, Honorable Members, you have these management, the management reports. <coughs> on page 54, a loan to Uganda Clays Limited was granted on 29th December 2010. It was unsecured and was repayable within 96 months in eco monthly installments commencing after a grace period of two years effective 27th december now the question i have actually page 54 and uh, page 75 the fund disbursed the loan worth 20 billion to uganda clays at 15 percent up to date no amount has ever been recovered Unless you tell us otherwise. First of all, during this period, when you gave Uganda Clays this loan, it was making losses. We have looked at its financial statements, 2010, 2009. It was making losses. Now, can you provide reasons to why you have never recovered this money? Now, to the former MD, Mr. Vyarugav, this may be a conflict of interest depending on how you respond. You are the same chairman audit committee of Uganda Clays, and you are appointed on 29th October 2010. This is the same year the unsecured loan was given to Uganda Clays. It has also come to our attention that this loan has been written off. Now you are writing off money that belongs to the save. It's not money from the consolidated fund. So can you explain to us, maybe the board did it, you give us a resolution of the board and we take it from there. How? Because it is here in the... Auditor General's reports, management reports, these ones never surface. I don't know why. Page 54 and page is page 75. So kindly explain to us. No, 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 we're not asking you investment. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you so much, members. Um, Uganda Clays is a a sad and an unsad story. Let me start off with the sad. The company borrowed money in order to expand. Their product was 
required in the market and they felt that they needed to expand uh, their production. So at the time, management of Uganda Clays sought to set up a new factory in Mbale. Good idea, but badly executed. So the money they borrowed from us was not sufficient to put the, the, the factory that they had wanted to set up uh, in the right place. In fact, uh, the products that were coming out of the factory after it was commissioned couldn't sell. The losses were quite high. So that's the reason why the company failed to repay the loan. Uh, as is prudent, uh, if you have a non-performing loan, as that was, the fund was under obligation to provide for it and to make, take reasonable steps to try and recover it. However, as you correctly observed, the company were making losses and therefore were not in a position to pay. So let's fast forward. Um, I think two years or three years ago, um, having seen that this company, which we have a, quite a big share of, was really going uh, down and our money was never perhaps going to be recovered, we literally took over the management and seconded our staff, I think two or three staff, into the company. We provided them with um, ways and means of trying to improve the company. And as I speak today, the company has turned around. The company has become profitable. And the company has reinstituted the loan on its books. And the company now is in a position to begin paying the loan. Of course, they would have to pay it uh, at an interest rate which has been agreed and the fund members uh, assurance to them that their money will be recovered but as i said this is a sad story because of the decision that were made by management of the company at the time but it's also a good story because i believe that the reason why the company has turned around is largely because of the effort of nssf as a shareholder putting in the right expertise and the right uh, uh, the right board to be able to do so, including me being on that board. Uh, Chair, can I seek some clarification? I was not in for this question. I'm a bit perturbed. Does the Savers Fund and the Commercial Bank operate the same? That's this is a loan, not an investment. You mean the fund has reached a level of now behaving like Standard Chartered and any other commercial bank? That's a very good question because, in fact, you will notice that the law of UBRA, when it came in place in 2011, uh, asked banks, sorry, asked pension funds not to lend. So that activity was stopped in 2011. As the chairman said, this loan was disbursed in 2010. No. Just before you come in, my understanding is NSSF is profit motivated, not a bailout. Now, Mr. Vyarugaba, you were appointed on the audit committee of Uganda Clays on 29th October 2010. Is this true? It's not true because I wasn't even an, an I was just an, I had just been a appointed to the NSSF. So I'm not too sure that appointment, uh, actually I don't know, I, I can't remember, I can't remember. But I know that I was appointed on the board of Uganda Clays uh, largely to help us uh, manage the company on their board because of the fact that A, we were a large shareholder, I think we own about 32%, and secondly because Mr. we had lent... Mr. Vyaruga, stayed on the Maybe you go and check, but we have the appointment letter. You were appointed on the board of Uganda Clays on 29th October 2010. On 29th December 2010, after you had been appointed on the board of Uganda Clays, you now gave them this 20 billion loan. So there's no way you can say I was appointed to supervise, yet your appointment at Uganda Clays was before 
they even got the loan from NSSF. Is that the loan was made before I even joined the fund? It's only that we disbursed after I joined the fund. The approval by the board of NSSF happened before my okay. time. Okay, point us the right direction. Who here approved the loan? There was a risk evaluation of this loan before it was disbursed to Uganda Claim. Was there a risk evaluation? Luckily enough, is the one with the microphone how you invested in a loss making company because when you look at their financial statement for 28 20 actually it's 20 2008 2009 2010 they were making losses so how did you get savers money and invest it in a loss making company tell us about it uh M mr chair like the former md has said the decision to give a loan to Uganda Clays was taken earlier than October. I joined NSSF. Was it taken by you? I joined NSSF mm. in 2010 on 1st September. Can we have members of your team who were there? None of my, none of, none of my team was there because I've been there longer than them. So, so no one Please allow me to give you uh, information regarding that particular investment. Whatever you give us yes. must be binding. Do not give hearsay. No. You must have the exact information. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the loan that was given to Uganda Clays was 11 billion. It wasn't 20 billion. Only that at the time of uh, at the time at, at in 2015, sorry, yeah, in 2015, they were supposed to have commenced payment. And the interest that the interest and penalty, the, sorry, the interest and penalty had accrued up to uh, that amount of 20 billion. But there is, we prepare our financial statements in accordance with international financial reporting standards. And if there is, if 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 a loan has to be paid, and the person to whom it has been given is not in a position to pay, that is a credit event which requires you to then provide for it. Now, although it has been provided Were you for, there? Sorry? Were you there at that time? No, I wasn't there. But I'm just trying to explain for the benefit of the committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, although it has been provided for in our financial statements, that is a requirement for financial reporting. The reality is that we've not stopped pursuing Uganda claims to pay the loan. Now, since you decided to respond, you switch on your microphone. Yes. Was this loan written off, yes or no? It was fully provided for. It hasn't been written off. It hasn't been written off? No. The two are different. How much is a share in a loss-making company? Okay, the, 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 that's a bit, of, a bit of a difficult question. The beauty is that the loan, the loan, um, the loan has, a pre although it is unsecured, but the, to the extent that the fund has uh, uh, a, a significant influence on the company by having mm -mm 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 okay. risk. How did you okay give an unsecured loan of savers money to a company like Uganda Clays that was making losses for three financial years? You don't say too much. Is yes or no? No. You don't find it irregular. Oh, so <laughs> I didn't get. Uh, it, it's irregular. It was not proper. It was not proper. Yes. Uh, Mr. Biarugaba, was. No, it wasn't written off. It is fully provided for. That means that you've got the asset sitting on your books and you've got the liability out of your profit and loss sitting on the other side. So in the books uh, of the fund, it might show like it is zero, but it is actually. Uh, fully provided for. Okay, it was given to Uganda Clays in 2010. How much have you recovered? We haven't recovered, but we have since restructured it to make the company uh, in a better position to pay. Yeah. When was the restructuring done? Uh, and how much is it now? The restructuring was done in 2022. We can avail the committee the details of the restructuring. 
last question from my side i know honorable um we bought shares in uh, housing finance and this is also on page 54 we bought shares in housing finance and uh, no we, we gave them money actually there are two loans not so were they two loans yeah. there are two loans the first one was 22.5 billion is this true, true. Mm -hmm. the second was 29 billion is this true Allow, allow us to consult and then give you the response to that. Okay. As you consult on the second one, the first loan was 22.5 billion. We were giving it to them at an interest of 15%. Who changed the interest from 15 to 13%? Yeah, the two figures are correct. Okay. Yeah. So the first amount we gave it, uh, uh, we gave housing finance was 22.5. We signed and gave it to them at 15%. Under what circumstances did it drop to 13% interest? Mr. Chair, in the loan agreement, there was a provision or a clause that the interest would be reviewed every two years. And that one depended on the market conditions at the time. So the server is losing? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Because what tends to happen is that you find that... Who determined? You just tell us who determined? The uh, market. The market. So essentially you find that at that time, interest rates would have dropped across the market. Mm. Yeah. But there must be a process. We are interested in who was in the process. The process is done by uh, the investment team, essentially, and recommended Point accordingly. Amongst your members, who, is, who is on your... We are, we are boring the back, the people seated at the back. Okay. Um, mm. Can you give me a, a name of any individual from your investment team? No, no, in 2013... No, 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 no. Okay. G g propose two or three names, I, uh, we select one. Ibrahim Buya. And on another one? And Muhammad Kasumba. And another one? Those are enough. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us a third? Okay, uh, Chinele Fred Bugabe. Mr. Fred, kindly stand up. <laughs> this Honorable Committee, how you came, what steps were involved in changing the interest rate from 15 to 13? Okay, thank you, Chair. Mm. For that process, I'm not sure. But what I'm sure of is that uh, uh, what happens in the market. So if the, uh, you have agreed that the loan is going to be reviewed, maybe well, annually... We know, but we want to know who sat on that table. No, I wasn't on that table. Can you nominate someone else apart from the two they mentioned? Ibrahim Boya. That one was mentioned. We want a lady. Uh, no, that is the team that uh, sits on that table. But you said Ibrahim you, you Buya, Muhammad. On, you said you are not on the table. I wasn't there. Okay, get us someone else. We have run out of time. Ibrahim Buya. Uh, so that transaction was the agreement says that every two years the interest rate had to be reviewed because the rate was benchmarked on the yield to maturity of a two-year government board plus a spread of 2%. So if you note, even when we went down to 13%, we increased the gain back to 15%. So it's not like it was one-sided. So if the YTM, the yield to maturity, on a two-year bond was 11%, we add a spread of 2%. Okay. Yeah. You, you just stay there. Now... Do you do this without consultation of the board? The, 
The, you the, will investment team sit somewhere and just do your things? No. We will do it because there was a loan, there is an agreement in place. Yes, I know. Yes. But when you are restructuring money mm. Mm. that is going to affect the server, positively mm. or negatively, mm. aren't you supposed to get a board resolution to that effect? I am not sure legally what it is, but I know that it goes to MIC. Stop, stop there. Yeah. Uh, co uh, corporation secretary. When you are restructuring a loan that is going to affect the save, do you need a board resolution or not? Sure, is it a yes or no answer or can I explain? Is yes or no? Sure, not necessarily. That's why I'm requesting to explain. Explain. Thank you. So, Chair, the investment decisions are determined by the provisions of the investment policy and manual in their delegated mandates. So, there are, there are transactions that have delegated certain authorities to management and the board ratifies. So, in that case, management would make the decision and present to the board for ratification. There are decisions that require that the board actually makes the decision. So that's why it's not a yes or you know, no answer. In the, in the, when we are drafting our final report, whatever you have stated is what we will include. Are you sure about what you are saying, that you do not need a board resolution? So Chair, Chair with your indulgence, if I could just complete my submission. Mm -hmm. So there are those scenarios. So it's dependent on the provision in our investment policy and manual. Now for this specific case, we would need to check and confirm. I don't know of head. But if you allowed, would verify. But that's how it would be handled ordinarily. So if it no, is under have, management... We have heard your yes. side, Thank and you. we shall make our, our observation. Mm. Uh, Corporation Secretary, is there an investment decision you make without a board resolution? Yes. You, you leave them, they have given us what they, they think is supposed to be done. So. Chair, may I answer? You, I thought you already answered. Oh, okay. So yes, um, so there are decisions, for example, right now, and we have fixed income, bonds, where we actually have um, provision to invest and then inform the board. And this is on the basis of waivers that were obtained actually from the regulatory authorities. So the answer is yes. And there is evidence. Every quarter we report and avail these reports. The provisions of the policy and money would be very helpful for guiding the Third investment we have heard from your council. Okay. Okay. I don't think you want to participate in this. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, the, la uh, the, the, the second loan, this was the last question. The second loan was 29 billion. Not so? This was reported in 2016. Honorable members, it's also on page 54. It was reported in 2016 at 29 billion. Is currently showing nine billion, and yet when you look at the financials, if they had paid the twenty, it should have reflected on your account. So where is the money? Because it is not on your account, and currently you are stating housing finance now the loan stands at nine billion. So where is the twenty billion? Yes. If you are comfortable, you respond. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the loan will naturally amortize over time, so which means there will be payment of interest and principal over the duration of the loan. So when we say that the amount today is nine, or at the time that you, you saw the nine, or sorry, at the, at the period that you saw that it was nine, it would mean that there has been repayment of interest and principal because it's an amortizing loan. Mm, no. You have not responded to the question. 2016, we gave them 29. Yep. Now the loan stands at 9. When you look at the financial statements of NSSF, it is not captured. So where is the 20 billion? Where are the repayment? Where, okay, where, are, where have they paid this loan? Okay, Chair, we can avail the committee the so details. That's why I of, said you should yes. not respond to things unless you're yes. sure. Finance. Yes. Where is the 20 billion? I'm going to request that I refer and get back to you. I don't want to give you wrong information. If you give me a few minutes. Okay. 
I thought I would ask a corporation secretary lastly. The minutes of the board are supposed to be filed with URSB. Is this true or not? Chair, it's not true. Mm. Not for statutory entities. Mm -hmm. URSB is for companies incorporated under URSB. So we don't file our minutes with URSB. You say because it does not co it, it, it does not apply for statutory body. Yes, there is no provision in our law that mandates that requires that we do so. Okay, we will capture whatever you tell us. We are here to observe. Uh, <coughs> for my, now, now let me ask Mr. Yut. Lubowa has two land titles. That Lubowa you are constructing uh, very expensive houses on has two land titles. Are you aware, yes or no? I believe Lua may have more than two land titles. I mean titles belonging to another individual and the necessary. Uh, that's a matter I think we are even in court with, the, with those individuals. So we know there's contention on that. Okay. Uh, I have issues with the card, but let me give the smart card and the payway machines. But let me first give my honorable colleagues the chance. Honorable Baka wanted to ask first, then honorable... I will go to the presentation of management, just briefly. But before I go to that, Chair, you posed the question to the acting MD about the land titles. You said it doesn't matter you are in courts. I doubt if you have answered the question. Either the court rules in your favor not currently the land titles are in which names the ones you know of the board um my apologies uh, i don't think i said it, it doesn't matter <laughs> i think i responded and said this is a matter that's under quotation now my understanding is some individuals went to the land offices through one working with them managed to get titles that of that was overlaid of our land. And that seems to be the matter that's going on now in court. Uh, Chair, before I leave that, investment knows very well that you do due diligence, you do this and that. If an outsider like me can know the names on those land titles, are you sincere to us you don't know the names of the land titles, uh, on the, those land titles? Because you are saying some individuals, maybe investment knows that. Who are those individuals? Mr. Chair, allow me to uh, to put the question to the CS because they are the custodians of the titles. But you are the head of investment. Yeah, but the titles are with legal. So you mean you invest place. in something you don't understand? No, no, no. That's actually we found okay, that piece of land. Okay, pass it, pass it. 